spirit uh, of the Dialogue of Civilization Institute, they are coming from very different perspective in order to have a global conversation. So we have today uh, Dr. Wong, uh, who will speak from Beijing. And Dr. Wong is the CEO and the founder of the Center for China and Globalization, and also uh, a member of the supervisory board of the Dialogue of Civilization Institute, which is itself actually also represented by uh, his founder and the chairman of the Dialogue of Civilization Institute, Dr. Yakunin, uh, who is uh, uh, connected from um, uh, Moscow in Russia, and who will uh, uh, give uh, the concluding uh, remarks of this uh, webinar. The second uh, guest and speaker will be Shada Islam, uh, who uh, is the director of Europe and geopolitics at uh, Friends of Europe in Brussels, and who also happens to be a close friend of DOC as a member of the Program Council. The third speaker is also uh, a, a close ally and partner, uh, Mr. Suresh Prabhu, uh, who is a special advisor to the Prime Minister of India and also the Sherpa for the G20 uh, for India. Uh, he has served as a prominent minister in uh, the last uh, government of uh, Minister of Prime Minister Modi. So as you can see, these are very, in a way, very different perspective, um, a very different ge uh, geographical perspective. So today we will be looking at the geopolitical impact of the crisis. And when we mentioned this question, many questions arise and many questions are coming to the surface. To what extent, if and how uh, the coronavirus crisis will impact the world order, if and how it will exacerbate the tension or the rivalry between the US and China, if and how it will eventually weaken or even destroy or dismantle um, international or multilateral cooperation, or eventually it will, it will be uh, some sort of a wake up call and a time for a reset. Um, so. There are plenty of questions that are arising. The perspective, in a way, is quite bleak. And I would like just to summarize, you know, maybe the, the spirit and the fear, and that maybe would be the first question that I will ask you um, this morning uh, in an interview, the French Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Jean-Yves Le Drian, when asked about how the new world will be looking like, said the world after the coronavirus will look like the world before, but even in worst. So uh, do you agree with this? What are your, in a way, scenario uh, about the coronavirus uh, post-world? I will be giving to each of our three guests six minutes approximately for an initial statement. Um, and, um, and then uh, we will have uh, about uh, 60 minutes or 50 minutes for questions coming from all of our participants. Uh, I see that we have uh, 120 participants connected. Uh, please, if you want to ask question as of now, you just click on the chat uh, icon and I will start uh, collecting and compiling uh, the questions. So um, uh, don't hesitate to start asking questions, making comments that I will put forward and convey to the speakers. Um, but for now, uh, I'm happy to give the floor first to Dr. Wong. Thank you. Thank you, uh, John Christopher and uh, uh, Dr. Yakunin and uh, distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, uh, good, 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 good evening, good afternoon, good morning, <laughs> our friends and, uh, and uh, uh, participants. And uh, so it's really a, a great uh, honor to participate in your uh, great uh, 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 webinar. Uh, what I, I can see actually now is that uh, we are talking about global pandemic, but I think that this pandemic has never been seen in the history of mankind of such magnitude, of such uh, depth and such uh, devastating impacts, because that has never happened uh, in terms of uh, <clears throat> giving uh, diseases like that, uh, the scope of uh, uh, impact in the world. So I think the, the globalization is, is facing uh, unprecedented uh, challenges. We are living a, a turbulent time, and uh, we are now, uh, as, you know, a global villagers living on Earth, Earth's planet. We are facing attack from Mars. We are, we are, <laughs> you know, we are how, how we can really 
uh, uh, protect ourselves is really fundamental. So, 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 uh, uh, so this is really um, uh, unprecedented uh, uh, for all the history uh, of mankind. What I think that uh, really uh, 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 bothers us now is that uh, after you know the globalization of the uh, last 70 years of uh, UN uh, history and uh, uh, WTO, uh, uh, World Bank, and uh, all the Bruton Woods product, uh, what, 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 what's going to be left after this uh, uh, coronavirus? So what I think now is that uh, we are facing a, a uh, either or, you know, either we, we go down with the coronavirus or we really thrive uh, on this uh, coronavirus because of, uh, of the new uh, reshape and rebirth of uh, maybe, or maybe re, uh, re, <coughs> reintegrate, uh, innovative of the new global uh, uh, system. So here I'd like to uh, really propose uh, or maybe make uh, several uh, observations. First, I think that uh, uh, globalization will continue Deglobalization is uh, really a, a danger for all of us, and we can see that uh, deglobalization is uh, populism, nationalism is uh, is swept uh, around the world, and we have uh, 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 governments actually uh, 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 actually um, using that as well. So I think we have to be really careful of this deglobalization uh, movement. But I think that globalization will continue because through this uh, financial uh, this uh, coronavirus, we have never realized that we are now. <laughs> In, in, in the same planet, we are in a global. Uh, we are all global villagers. We are in the same boat. Our, our, our destinies are con connected. Uh, we cannot separate each other. We, we uh, nobody's island. No country is an island. So we have to uh, live together and, and work together and fight together for our survival of the human uh, 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 mankind. And then the, the humanity will prevail. So that's my observation number one. Number two is that uh, we we will have to uh, really uh, uh, you know the uh, st stimulate the trade because uh, given the history of the first uh, first world war or second world war you know it was also the financial crisis or 911 it was the trade that really lifted the world out of the uh, woods so again we, we need to uh, really build up these uh, strengthen the global value chain that we already have right now i think that global value chain is is under an enormous challenge we, we are facing decoupling we are facing uh, you know, the, the movement of the people has been stopped and uh, uh, tourism has stopped. So that really uh, a great uh, a danger to, 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 to our humankind. So I think uh, what, what we, we have to do is we have to maintain the global value chain and we cannot decouple from each other. We really have to work uh, uh, with the, uh, uh, the spirit of, uh, of the cooperation so that we can really, you know, have the G20, uh, have the uh, really uh, working together and we should have all the countries fight together and then have a more coordinated approach. We cannot let multilateralism fail, fail us. So this is really uh, uh, imp important uh, that we have to really work on it. Otherwise, we're going to see a, a, a miserable war probably ahead of us. Uh, my third observation is that uh, we should really now give a bit more a tolerance, give a bit more, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's not the end of the history. Uh, as uh, Fukuyama san just said, I, I think that we have to, uh, you know, really uh, have all people have all, uh, all the other countries uh, have their unique way of fighting this uh, coronavirus. We should share our experience, but we should not impose our values to others. I think, you know, uh, after all, we will see uh, no country is, is perfect. And uh, uh, even for China, for example, this time they had, uh, they were the first country to suffer from this coronavirus. But also, the public is the first country to, to get out of this uh, uh, virus and did a quite a, a decent job in terms of containing it. So, so I think that uh, you know, after this, we'll keep a, uh, we have to see that uh, you know, the, the, the way, the experience, the, uh, the, the, the government's model they have, you know, maybe have some merits to you know, in tackling this kind of a gigantic uh, uh, threat to the mankind. And uh, uh, as China lifted 800 million part of property, as China become the largest trading nation, for 120 countries, uh, China could help more. China could really, uh, uh, you know, really on this coronavirus fighting, supporting all the other countries and shared experience and learn from others as well. Uh, my final observation is that I think uh, we should really forget about those uh, those uh, geopolitical, uh, uh, you know, uh, differences. Really focus on, uh, you know, how we can save lives, how we can save the livelihood of the of the mankind. And the most important, I think we should really also strengthen the, uh, the global 
public health governance uh, in, in, at now and also in the future. Uh, if, if anything else, this time has reminded us that global governance of uh, public health for the mankind is so important. This is something new. I think we have never learned from uh, when uh, we are not learning from this crisis. So I think we need to really strengthen the global uh, governance uh, for, uh, for the public health. And we should uh, really strengthen the trade. We should really strengthen the WTO, uh, strengthen the uh, World Bank, IMF, or, you know, all the infrastructure, AIB and things like that. So the international organization should play a more important role. WHO should be strengthened, uh, should be more supportive. I think we can always improve, we can always uh, 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 doing better, we can always do better, but I think we should not stop, uh, you know, uh, stop the multilateral uh, support for fighting this disease. So in, in, in another, in, in the one note, I think I want to conclude now that uh, everybody, all the countries are good friends. Uh, China is really willing to, to learn from others and we are willing to support. We are, we are really sharing a, a, a one common earth. We are sharing our own future together. So I want to just thank you. Thank uh, you, Henry. And uh, now I'm giving the floor immediately to Shada Islam. Thank you very much, Jean Christophe. Hello, everyone. Uh, hello from Brussels. It's a nice spring day. Um, Jean Christophe, I'm uh, cautiously optimistic. I read also with great interest what the French foreign minister said about how we will come out of this uh, worse than we are now. I don't see how that can happen. We're really, really down at the moment. And I'm really hoping that this will be a transformative moment. We're living through very, very uh, emergency measures at the moment. I'm in lockdown here in Brussels. We're not really sure when the lockdown will be eased. I think working from home for the last five weeks, actually, doing okay, but working from home. It's a different environment. So we're living through three kinds of emergencies simultaneously. And that obviously makes us a little bit cautious and grim at the moment. First of all, of course, it's the COVID-19 emergency, which is really, as you said, Henry, a global pandemic and is showing the uh, fragilities of the health sectors, not just in the developing world, but also in our developed world here in Europe and the United States. So there's the health emergency. There is an economic crisis underway. Millions of people are out of work. Even more will be out of work as we come out of the lockdown. Uh, we need more fiscal space for governments. We need emergency rest rescue packages for developing countries. And the big danger is that this big disruption that we're living through will turn into a big depression. And the IMF uh, uh, head, uh, Kristalina Georgieva, has said so. And third is what you said, Jean-Christophe, we're living through a geopolitical emergency as well. US-China relations are really toxic, acrimonious. We're engaging in blame games. And instead of working together, as Henry has said, we are actually not working together. We're trying to hamper in international collaboration. And this is having a big impact in our hunt for the vaccine, in coming to the help of countries that need medical personnel, need protective outerwear, need masks. So we really need to get our act together. This is a moment for all hands on deck. And that is not happening for one simple reason. We are engaged in all kinds of geopolitical uh, great power competition. At this time, uh, this is not the game to play. This is a moment to come together. And as Henry has said, there are several ways we can do this. Now, as the Second World War was ending, wise leaders from across the world came together and had what we call the Bretton Woods moment, a moment where we decided no more wars. We were going to work together, work together to build a better world through multilateral organiza organizations. Now, what do we have at the moment? You know how interesting that the United Nations Security Council has not been able to meet to talk about this. They tried, but it did not work out. The WTO is fragilized because of competition between the US and China, the trade and tech war. We have the WHO, which is getting all kinds of uh, uh, criticism for being too close to China, for not being independent enough. So we have multilateral organizations that are fragilized. We have leaders across the world that are more into the populist 
game or winning elections or winning over public opinion than really caring for the nationals. We have a global infrastructure for health which is extremely fragilized. And we have countries in South Asia, in Africa, that are really warning now that they need their debt to be forgiven, they need rescue packages. Millions of people are out of work. And what are we, what are we doing at the moment? We're just engaging in blame games and propaganda wars. I think that is not the way forward. My final point, Jean Christophe, really is that we have to start thinking about the future about the economic future, about the recovery. And there, once again, we need to work together. Economic nationalism will not lead to increased trade or investments. Putting up barriers, putting up export barriers or import barriers is going to dampen and deaden the economy even further. So we really need to get our act together now to start thinking, how are we going to have a global recovery plan? Who's going to be doing what and in what speed and, and when? Thank you. Thank you, Shada. I, I mean, I take from both of you a very strong call uh, for uh, strengthening and developing uh, multilateral cooperation. Um, I'm curious to know if uh, from an Indian perspective, uh, you share those views. I also uh, keep, you know, this notion of the, the Bretton Woods moment, and maybe uh, that could be one of the outcome of those discussion is uh, how to revive this flame, how to revive this uh, sort of visionary leadership uh, that is needed uh, to in this uh, post uh, crisis. Uh, but uh, first, I mean, uh, um, Suresh, uh, you have the floor. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, as we are entering a very interesting phase of uh, human life, which at least our generation has never seen before. And I don't think even past generations have experienced anything of this kind. We talk about Great Depression, we talk about World War, but I don't think any, anybody has really experienced anything of this kind. Even the World War has not affected as many countries as the coronavirus has affected. Therefore, it is truly a different kind of a global phenomena which we have to deal with. And as it happens, we can stop the war when the ammunition gets over. We can stop the war when the statesmen think that we need not go ahead with this. But it's a kind of war which we cannot stop by just we wishing it to be stopped. It is something, the force of nature, which is now unleashed, which is causing so much of damage, and everybody is struggling to find an answer to this. So in a situation like this, obviously we need a global response. While at the same time, we need local action. The global response is necessary because we are learning from each other. What happened in one other country, people are trying to use it as a data to determine the policy actions and policy options that we have in front of the other country, which is going to face the next crisis. So we need global cooperation. And the global cooperation must be transcending into areas beyond health, because once we address this issue, and I'm sure some medication, some vaccine which will be developed, will be able to address it. But the aftermath of this is going to be as important, as crucial, and as more challenging, like the economic cost, the social cost. So to deal with that, we obviously need, again, a very good global cooperation and global integration, global action. To do that, we need institutions. Now, we have seen that some institutions are already under pressure even before the COVID-19. The WTO is facing existential crisis. United Nations is not as effective as it should be. So we really need institutions which will be really dealing with this type of situation in future. So we probably, after the war, after the last world war, we thought about new institutions, Britain with institutions. I think now we'll have to come together to find out the efficacy of the institutions and how to make them modern, how to make them relevant to today's times, how to make them stronger, more effective. So we'll have to deal with that. While we do all this, there is a luckily, there is an institution, if not an institution, a platform called G20. And I'm very happy to see that G20 took this leadership. The Prime Minister of India, I can speak, had actually went and talked about global response that is necessary to deal with COVID, as well as the response that is necessary to deal with economic consequences that will follow as a result of this. So therefore, we need 
definitely institution, but at least we have a platform, which is just 20 countries, but which represents 86% of the global GDP. These are the countries in different parts of the world, and therefore they have a geographical reach to deal with a situation that will emerge out of this. So I think we must focus on finding out how we build institutions to deal with situations like this. We need early warning system. If something like this is going to happen, if pandemic was going to be around, as was probably foreseen by some other experts, why we couldn't act on it earlier is something as a global community. So world global institutions, global community must introspect, find out, and work in a way that we really resolve these issues in a proper manner. The point is, the humanity, whether we like it or not, are actually integrated, far more integrated than any time in the past. It's not just the markets are integrated, but societies are also integrated in some form or other. The technology has made it possible that whatever happens in very far remote part of the world gets into your drawing room the same moment. So therefore, the societies are now, we are feeling the pain of a far away crisis. So we are integrated emotionally, socially, if not necessarily economically and politically that much. So therefore, we must find out how to deal with human crisis of this nature, of this magnitude, of this kind, and what kind of a response we should think about it. So I really welcome this initiative. I know my dear friend Bas, who has been doing this great job for many, many years to bring communities and societies together. I'm sure we'll work together to make sure that we avert the future crisis. We deal with the aftermath of this present crisis in a way that will reduce the pain of as many people as possible, and particularly the most vulnerable people in the poorer countries of the world. So thank you very much for the opportunity. As I requested you earlier, I need to leave, but I was very happy to participate in this program. And I really looking forward to working with such distinguished people who are part of this community. I can see so many of them joining in from different parts of the world that itself is a strength that despite a crisis, we want to get together to address this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Prabhu. Uh, thank you for your, uh, your statement and, and, and analysis. And we very much regret actually that you have to leave, uh, but um, uh, we did have taken good account of what uh, you, you told us. And so we will continue the discussion. Hopefully you can take part in a further uh, event uh, to the discussion. Uh, it's indeed very important also to remind that uh, DOC, uh, the Dialogue of Civilization Institute has very strong roots and cooperation with India and very pleased to work with uh, the India Foundation that uh, uh, you are uh, running uh, together with uh, other leaders. So thanks a lot. And so maybe we can start now the, the discussion. Uh, we have plenty of uh, questions coming from uh, many parts of the world. Actually, there are lots of questions, uh, Dr. Wong, about uh, how it will, this crisis will affect also uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, but also more broadly speaking, um, let's say, uh, China's uh, outwards development. Uh, thank you, John Christopher. I thought so. I, I, I shared all the uh, previous uh, speakers, uh, a lot of views that uh, uh, the, it's really, we are facing this common threat. I think for, for, for China now that uh, the, the globalization will, will, will be accelerated. I, I don't think we're going to slow down because uh, uh, one of the things I do think that going to impact though is this this global value chain will will, will suffer temporarily. I think because of uh, because of the uh, slowing down of the transportation airlines and everything uh, people to people movement. But this will be temporary temporarily. But I think once we get over this coronavirus, uh, probably once we uh, have the vaccine developed, we'll really catch up and uh, we have some uh, uh, really uh, uh, much much faster, much more stronger. Uh, Development. I think for China uh, to uh, to the, the one of the good reasons that China can survive this uh, coronavirus crisis uh, probably uh, until now is uh, doing be relatively better is precisely China has all this great uh, infrastructure. China has a uh, very good roads. China has a very good uh, telecommunication, big data. For example, that uh, China has a, has a pinpoint where where is the effects the cases are. 
uh, where, where uh, you know, whether you are safe or not, just by scanning your mobile, and then it can tell you are you are you are you are, in, you are re uh, highly risk or not risk or, or, uh, or really uh, free to work. So that's really important. So so I think that also infrastructure wise as well, you know, five G and all this technology. So what I think that the the, the, the Belt and Road Initiative that China has initiated several year, years ago will 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 of, of course continue, but probably more focused now, but more focused on those uh, uh, life saving, uh, more health related, more uh, public, uh, uh, you know, uh, safety uh, uh, infrastructure, and more on the, you know, uh, telecommunication. For example, uh, China has developed technology now that uh, they can screen your long uh, picture on computer just by a remote uh, doctor can see that very well. So, so I'm thinking of, uh, of uh, Belt and Road uh, uh, will we're not, we're not be stopped, I'm sure, at the end, but we will but, but, but also we can see how developing countries can, uh, really uh, will be benefiting from this initiative. And also we would like to uh, propose, uh, you know, at least from our think tank point of view, that World Bank and uh, a ADB, uh, AFDB, all the international development banks, plus AIB should work together on Belt and Road. So we should have an international consortia uh, for some of the common identified project or have a kind of a system so that we can multilize Belt and Road is just not only China initiative. Let's make it a global initiative. I think also after uh, the coronavirus, the, the world is lacking stimulus, lacking a big project. And I, I think Belt and Road can provide a good opportunity for the uh, uh, future project to stimulate the uh, 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 world out of this great recession that's caused by coronavirus. Does that mean that in your views, the Belt and Road could become some sort of the the Marshall Plan of the coronavirus uh, post crisis. I, I would not. I would not say. Uh, well, Marshall Plan probably have a similar function, but, but Marshall Plan is a, is a, is a, a big, a massive uh, stimulating plan, uh, investment plan to 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 re revive the world after the Second World War, revive the uh, rebuild the reconstruct the world. So, so I think the Belt and Road already had a quite a good foundation there. Let's let's focus a bit more now on Belt and Road, and then let's have a more international cooperation participation from all the international agencies, international uh, companies, multinationals, particularly uh, international lending agencies. So if they can really work together, I think you know infrastructure revolution and infrastructure stimulus would be a major uh, uh, way getting out of the, the, this crisis. From China's experience, you know, like in two thousand eight, China has a four trillion RMB uh, stimulus package, largely on the infrastructure. Actually, CCG, we have conducted recently a few uh, webinar on new infrastructure, which will talk about uh, you know, 5G, telecommunication, uh, big data, you know, uh, uh, all those uh, software online, and e-commerce, di digital delivery, and all those. So those new infrastructure are really needed to fight this uh, uh, coronavirus. And that for, will be for sure for the future stimulus recovery plan for the world if, if, if it's rightly implemented. Thank you, uh, Henry. A uh, question now uh, for uh, Shada. Um, uh, one of them is coming uh, from uh, Dr. Frendo, uh, who is a former Minister of Foreign Affairs in Malta, um, asking about, um, the, can you assess the, let's say the reaction from the EU? Um, there were a lot of talks that the EU was slow to reply, uh, slow and in a way has failed to express uh, solidarity among member states. Uh, there are also quite a few questions that, in a way, would be for both of you about uh, this also rising issue or concern um, uh, regarding democracy, uh, human rights, and um, uh, you know the traceability or the trackability uh, with um, the um, you know the uh, all those discussions that are revolving around this. So, could you um, give us element of response about that? Thank you, Jean-Christophe. Yes, very, very willingly, I'll talk about Europe. But before I do that, I think I'd like to just come back to a number of things that Henry uh, and, and uh, Prabhu spoke about as well, if you allow, just to give my side uh, of the picture. 
So I, I think we have to be very careful when we talk just about the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. This is not the only connectivity plan in the world today. It is an important one. It's got the most uh, financial heft behind it. Uh, we all agree about that. And I think Henry made a point when he said, if it's done in the right manner, and I think there are lessons that China can learn uh, from its past experience over the last six years on how to improve the BRI projects, how to be more uh, transparent, how to be more aware of social implications, how to involve domestic civil societies in it. Uh, and I think, you know, financial accountability, all of those things, if China's Belt and Road Initiative does evolve and becomes more of a multilateral initiative rather than China-centered, then I think we are on the right path. But as I was saying, it's not the Marshall Plan. The BRI is loans, it's not grants, it's not the Marshall Plan. And there are other connectivity projects around the world, which I think are equally valid and equally valuable in this post-COVID-19 phase, especially. And there, Japan has its uh, connectivity projects. The European Union has its projects. ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. And I do agree with you, Henry, and Friends of Europe has been saying this for some time. We need to multilateralize. We need to bring these connective, connectivity projects, which are going in all kinds of different directions, lots of duplication. Uh, lots of wastage, uh, bring them under the one banner and have a kind of advisory body or a plurilateral agreement where we can actually define the norms and standards that are needed for connectivity. So if we agree to do that, and this is beyond the BRI, I think we are on the right path. Uh, I'm also wary when people, and I have to say a lot of male people, talk about uh, the COVID-19 and a war against this pandemic. We're not talking about a war. There will be no winners and losers. We're talking about a global humanitarian, uh, economic, geopolitical effort where we're working together. I think war metaphors really uh, are, 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 are not appropriate for this very, very important and uh, moment where we need to work together. When we talk in terms of war, winners and losers, that's not the way the world is going to evolve. That's, I think, 20th century thinking. And I would wish that our leaders uh, uh, would, would change their conversation, would change their language when dealing with issues of such major sensitivity. Um, and finally, before I turn to Europe, China's role in the recovery is going to be primordial. And this is why this talk of decoupling the economies and you know, disrupting global supply chains. I mean, how are we going to rebuild these devastated economies, including in South Asia and Africa, if we're not going to be working together to uh, remove barriers, not to reimpose them. And what's very dangerous at the moment, including in Europe, is this economic nationalism. You know, even with the export of medical equipment and outerwear and masks, there have been import restrictions, export restrictions. Countries have not been able to extend in hand until, until very, very recently. So I think we need to really change transform the way we think and the way we act will come with it. And so I would really appeal to everyone to start thinking more in terms of a global collective collaborative effort rather than a war that has to be won somehow. This pandemic will go away, there will be others around the corner. What we have to do is reinforce our structures uh, so that we can cope and become not just resilient but transformative in how we deal with these crises. Now, Europe, um, I, I have said so, and uh, we, we are really hopeful that having learned the lessons of the first few weeks where we were slow in responding to what was happening in China, in Asia, we saw what was happening in China, and we did not take the necessary precautions. Our governments, our national leaders were really a little slow, if I could say that, modestly, very, very slow in responding. And it was only very late into the journey of the pandemic, if you like, that Europe really woke up and started going into its own measures. And as I said, I'm in lockdown. Most of Europe is in lockdown. Now we're thinking of coming out of the lockdown. And solidarity between European countries is not being very, very strong. Um, I agree with the foreign minister of Malta, the former foreign minister, when he says it's been a poor show of solidarity. Our governments have not acted as one, as a union. Uh, initially, I think one can understand that nation states have to act quickly because they are responsible, the governments are responsible to citizens and citizens go to the government and ask for um, uh, appropriate action and policies. So the first stage, I think, of 
okay, fine, you have nation states and national leaders working, but beggar thy, na thy neighbor policies were not the right ones. Now we're seeing a change. We're seeing some elements of solidarity coming into the picture. We're seeing the European Union institutions in Brussels taking charge, however much they can, because health, you know, is not an EU competency. So I think Europe is learning. And um, I think Corona will either kill, as a colleague of mine has said, Giles Merritt, will either kill Europe or cure Europe. And I'm really hoping, as the French foreign minister has said, that Europe will find its leadership destiny at this very, very important moment. Thank you, Shada. Um, we are talking a lot about, uh, or you are both actually calling for more international cooperation, uh, more uh, multilateral agreements. Um, this is very nice. I think we, I mean, many people agree, uh, but these are words. And how can we move from words to action or move from words to commitment? Um, we have two interesting questions. Um, one, uh, which is in a way an opportunity to give some sort of immediate evidence of a willingness to cooperate. Uh, and this is coming from Bertrand de la Chapelle, who is the CEO of Internet and Jur Jurisdiction, uh, which is a global NGO. Uh, we're saying, um, interestingly, that actually the retreat on national border um, has in a way justified or, you know, the 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 lockdown, I mean, that there was no cooperation, no, no concertation among countries uh, to decide uh, the time and the modalities of the lockdown. When it comes to uh, release the confinement and uh, wouldn't be making sense to have some sort of international cooperation or at least concertation uh, to get out of the confinement because we, it seems that for now that we have entered the lockdown and we are leaving the lockdown uh, only with uh, a national perspective, which look quite odd. The second question, uh, talking about um, possibility or opportunity to, you know, in a way to uh, move from words to commitment is, um, as we many of us know, uh, this year is the 75th anniversary of the creation of the United Nations. Um, in the initial plan, and I understand this is still the case, on September 21st, um, the head of state from around the world are supposed to convene and to converge to New York to launch a big call uh, for a new international cooperation at the occasion of the 75th anniversary. That was the plan before uh, the crisis. Um, and um, the question coming from Alexander Rahr, uh, who is in Germany, uh, is uh, to say, isn't it the time, I mean, when Shada, you mentioned before this sort of Bretton Woods moment, uh, is this summit, could this summit, could be eventually the time for a new peaceful world order call like it was after um, uh, you know the the end the, the the Vienna Congress in 1815 or the Versailles Treaty after World War One or the Yalta Agreement after World War Two, um, would there be a way and if and how to make it happening that this head of state summit could be actually the rebound or the reset uh, for a new multilateral framework uh, perspective. So these are two questions for both of you. Enrico first. Oh, thank you, thank you, uh, uh, yes. Well, I, I think that, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I, I agree with you, John Christopher, that uh, the world should uh, really uh, uh, have a more multilateral approach. And uh, uh, so, so this is the only time, uh, probably, I mean, in modern history, we have a uh, we have a 911. I think the world is really coordinated anti-terrorism. We have 208 financial crisis. The world is really coordinated, uh, you know, stimulate the world economy. This time is the time that we really uh, haven't seen any, uh, you know, uh, a very uh, concerted government uh, coordination. We have seen, of course, there is one G20 virtual meeting has happened, but the, but it was not really uh, any uh, very substance has been carried out. So, so I, I would really uh, think that uh, even for lockdown or unlockdown, we, we should really <laughs> have a better coordination. 
Uh, but but not only that, we we, we seemingly have only the, the World Health Organization is doing this kind of uh, uh, coordination uh, at, at, at maximum. Uh, but then, then this has also been uh, under threat because the funding is, is under threat. So so really, I I, I really fe felt uh, that uh, we should really put the political uh, politics aside and then concentrate on uh, working together, particularly after this crisis or during this crisis, we build up our global public health uh, global governance system. And this is absolutely the, the most important uh, job we should do. So this is uh, uh, the recommendation I can give. I think uh, I, I understand that the G7 is having meetings probably every month, but why can't G20 have a meeting every month? Why can't WHO calls for international health minister meetings every, every week? I mean, we should have better coordinating efforts on that. Uh, you are right. I mean, even, even national security of the UN can't hold in one meeting. How can we really uh, coordinate the world uh, together? So th this is really something uh, we, we politicians probably of all countries should, should think uh, alike and then put the uh, safety and the, and the health of the mankind uh, in first place. Second, on your on your on your question about UN 75 anniversary, I, I agree with you that uh, uh, we we are now uh, uh, you know uh, really uh, in a chaotic situation without coordination. Every country does its own conferences and uh, uh, things like that. So so the world uh, economy is, is is going down the hill, and then we probably uh, have a much uh, large uh, casualties on the uh, uh, in addition to the uh, uh, pandemic uh, crisis. So what I think is that uh, I, I think United Nations Security Council should immediately have meetings. Uh, UN General Assembly should have its uh, uh, virtual meetings as well. G20 should have a, a regular meeting. You know, trade ministers and the health ministers should meet immediately. And then also, uh, you know, like think tanks and uh, uh, should also work together, uh, put different proposals. Uh, so it's really with concerted efforts of every country uh, and also NGOs, uh, people to people friendly, uh, the twin cities, uh, provinces should all really work together. We, we need all level, uh, multi-level approach. Uh, I think that's the way to get out. But I think I still pin hope to the UN because uh, after all, this is the only uh, product that we have uh, after uh, Second World War. And then it's the only thing that really coordinated the world. We should not, we should safeguard it, we should uphold it, we should strengthen, innovate it and improve it. You know, uh, Jean-Christophe, um... I wish that would be the case uh, in September. I wish uh, Henry, you and you know people who hope for some defining moment uh, will be there. But when I talk about a Bre Bretton Woods moment, I'm not just talking about the politicians we have today. Uh, there is a general lack of wisdom. It's my country first policies and the September meeting will be just before the United States elections in November, presidential elections as well. So when we have at the moment, really a leaderless world, which can be a good thing, a leaderless world if other people can, you know, sort of work together as Henry is uh, suggesting, that would be brilliant. But at the moment we do have a vacuum. Uh, uh, Europe, you know, could fill the breach uh, that has been left by the United States, but doesn't really have the solidarity within and the unity within to take that spot now. Uh, it could happen in a few months or years, but at the moment uh, we are lacking the, the heft we need, the financial heft, but also the political heft at the moment. But I think what we will have to do is come together and revise the way we operate. Now, some of the things that Henry has said are very important. For instance, we focus a lot on states and we talk a lot about great power competition. But as we're seeing in today's world, uh, dealing with COVID-19 is bringing together countries that have actually small countries that are not considered the world's great powers. I'm talking about New Zealand, Korea, I'm talking about Taiwan, Hong Kong is doing a good job as well. So the, the focus is not just on how US, China or Europe are handling things. Germany is doing rather well as well in here in Europe. So there are countries that have the have the uh, potential to come out and work together, but they're being sort of sidelined by the great power competition games that our politicians are playing, but also I have to say our media is playing as well. So I'm hopeful that there will be a revision 
in people's minds about the importance of states. If you like, look at the United States, for example, uh, how these governors of states are standing up to some of the rather ridiculous instructions, if you like, uh, that are coming from Washington. You look at cities across the world, cities are proving that they are in the hands of very capable mayors who are often in disagreement with the nationalist politicians. So we are seeing power that is being used in a different manner. And that's where I think the Bretton Woods moment will have to come from pressure from below on leaders, which are not just national leaders, but also perhaps state leaders. If I may just also come back to uh, the questions on democracy and, and human rights. And this is one, one of the things, you know, uh, that is, I think, a, a great shame at the moment that many politicians across the world are using COVID-19 emergency to extend their authoritarian uh, powers to curb on the media, to, uh, crack down even further on the media, and also against dissidents. And I think civil society dissidents, etc. So I think this has become a bit of a smokescreen for the nationalist instincts that exist among many of the leaders. And I'm not pointing a finger at any one country. I think this is a tendency we see in the West, just as we do in parts of Asia and Africa and Latin America as well. And, and finally, your point about um, exit strategies, and you're absolutely right, we went into the lockdowns in a, in, in a rather ad hoc, uh, chaotic, confused manner. Could we come out of it in a more coherent and consistent manner, at least across Europe and, and other parts of the world? Um, I fear that that's not going to be the case either. Uh, the European Union has been trying very hard to come up with a unified or consistent policy for exit strategies across Europe, and it's proving very difficult. And I can understand why, because the national situation in every country, the health capacity of the hospitals, um, the, the, the search for masks, et cetera, is very different across different European countries. So national leaders will not take instructions from Europe. What they can do and what they should be doing more and more is exchanging information, coordinating with each other and telling each other what they will be doing. So I think that's the way we'll have to do it, more through information exchange, learning from each other, best practice exchange, rather than doing it simultaneously. That I think is unfortunate unfortunately, not going to be possible. Lots of questions also about um, the blaming game, uh, the war on information. Um, lots of concern also to see that there's some sort of an escalation uh, of the mutual suspicion. Uh, on one hand, saying that uh, the virus is coming out from a laboratory from Wuhan. Uh, on other hand, you know, people saying that uh, uh, there is some sort of a, um, a mask diplomacy that is irritating. Uh, so, you know, the, we see week after week uh, an escalation of uh, tensions, bitterness that could very well lead to some sort of a, a call for retaliation uh, if we don't manage to mitigate or to, uh, let's say, keep the debate uh, at the proper level. And how would you see this, uh, this issue? How can we prevent this escalation on the war on information, on, uh, on mutual suspicion? And how can we bring people together uh, under the tent? And uh, again, I mean, what we need is not just words, but uh, what are the actionable mechanisms or levers, you know, to uh, you know to to mitigate those those risks? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I think that uh, you know, John uh, uh, Christopher, that uh, uh, the, the human uh, uh, beings actually we should really look forward. Uh, you know, this is very unfortunate that we have this uh, uh, pandemic and the, and the coronavirus that the, the hit at the humankind and uh, and then china was very unfortunate also to be uh, hit at the first uh, as the first country but china did its best you know since i think they, they find some trace of that in, in december and then they immediately uh, the the national health commission sent down the expert team and then they immediately reported and then they immediately uh, you know started to uh, lock down the city so in, in by january the, the whole city of uh, of 10 million people has been locked down. The whole province of 60 million has been locked down. All those lockdowns also unprecedented in the history of mankind. 
uh, was 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 also a, a very risk move, movement for China to take. But China take the bold uh, action to do that, even at uh, a big sacrifice of the uh, uh, you know personal uh, freedom and of course also the uh, to productivity and the production. So, but I think you know these. They, so China has actually uh, also uh, in the first place uh, come back. Uh, you know, report is the WHO, and then and, and then release the uh, sequential of the of the virus genes and then to the, to the outside world. So China did its, I think, its best. Uh, uh, of course, you know, this is this is the only thing happened uh, never happened before. Uh, people have a learning curve. There's a, probably one case or, or the other that maybe a little slowness in 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 coming up to the response. But but not China was not deliberate. So all this conspiracy theory, I found that ridiculous. I mean. Uh, I see that uh, the U.S. CDC director uh, uh, speak at the White House and say, you know, this this is uh, you know coming from uh, after an analyze the genes of the virus. This is coming from some kind of animal, and uh, uh, you know they, they they are very sure of that. So the scientific community should come to come conclusions uh, rather than the politicians. So so I think that uh, uh, you know uh, what we are doing. I think right now the most important is really looking forward. So now, uh, you know, China is getting out of this uh, for months or two now, probably still have some a few cases uh, daily. And uh, Europe and the US and the other, many other countries also uh, uh, approaching the end of their lockdown, probably uh, uh, with another week, so months probably uh, just to finish that. So the, the challenge now remains, how can we revive the world? What are the experience, even with some kind of a little threat of the coronavirus, how we can revive, how we can uh, back to normal, how we can really, uh, rebuild the value chain and rebuild confidence, re rebuild the, the industry that, that facing bankruptcy and, uh, and uh, crisis. That's another thing coming up. So we should really, uh, you know, compare notes and uh, learn from each other how we can better uh, revive the economy. I mean, that's the thing that should be in all the government's mind. I think that, uh, you know, uh, you know, China experience was shared. You know, China has locked down cities, China has uh, built up temporary hospitals, China has uh, uh, you know, uh, have a, a social distance. Now it's widely practiced, you know, because China gone through that, China success, successfully contained that, and a lot of countries has also used the China experience. But I think now what we are trying to do is really how we can avoid this uh, uh, going down of the world economy. Uh, according to WTO, you know, this year GDP could shrink by one third or even more. And uh, so how, how can we, uh, you know, uh, come back, you know, you know, not losing uh, more lives of the so that's the most important thing I think we should all work together on that. Mm. You know, Jean-Christophe, this, uh, this pandemic has brought out the worst in us, but also the best in us. I mean, the best, we know what is happening, you know, individual, collective, group, uh, solidarity, people going out to help each other, people connecting uh, online, people helping the elderly. So it's really bringing out the best in, in, in many of us, uh, a sense of solidarity among citizens and civil society that sometimes our national leaders uh, are not showing. But it's also bringing out the worst in us. And I have to say, uh, one of the saddest things is not just the human, the uh, authoritarian creep that I talked about uh, a minute ago, but also these conspiracy theories, this battle of narratives, this allegations of mass diplomacy on one side, and you started it first, no, you did it first. You know, uh, politicians uh, of uh, huge countries, the so-called great powers, actually uh, behaving like children in, 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 a play, in a playground. And I think even with no adults in the room to stop them from doing that, because that is making us feel very, very vulnerable. Now, conspiracy theories abound in uh, times of uh, unpre unpredictability, in dangerous, risky times when people are feeling very vulnerable. We're all locked down. We're all online all the time, going on the internet, trying to find out what's happening to ourselves, to our neighbors, to our countries, to the world. And these conspiracy theories are thriving in that atmosphere of vulnerability of fragilized individuals and communities. People are looking for simple answers and uh, simple answers are provided by conspiracy theorists, but not just them, by politicians who've been saying to us for, for months and months, don't listen to the experts. We know better than them. All throughout Brexit debate in the UK, the experts were, were treated like trash. They were not important, it was just the politicians. And what are we learning now? We are learning that the experts, in this case, health experts, are the people we should be listening to. It's not, it's not like people like you and me. 
even. It's the health experts. They know what they're talking about. They know where it originated. They know how to deal with it. And their voices, their voices are not being heard. Instead, we're listening over and over again to the same voices calling uh, on blame games and finger wagging. Nobody comes out of this looking pristine. Nobody comes out of it looking like a saint. We're all, uh, I'm sorry to say this, but every single politician that I've heard in recent times, except for a few, and many of them have been female, I have to say, coming back to the gender issue here, which I insist on, and many of them have sounded more like bully boys uh, than as national leaders. Uh, I think the time is coming now also to hear from uh, Dr. Yakunin, who is the chairman of uh, Dialogue of Civilization Institute, you need to share his views, his perspective, and also his reaction on this debate. We have plenty of uh, uh, other questions, um, and I'm sorry for those of you, uh, you know, who have not been, uh, have not been able to, you know, to convey the question. Uh, we will uh, hopefully be able to get back to you uh, with a response. We are collecting all those questions. Uh, but before we turn to Dr. Yakunin, I'd like to ask you one other question that is coming quite often also about, um, let's say, the North-South uh, gap. Um, evidently, um, the rich countries will be able to, in a way, absorb or digest uh, the crisis from an economic perspective. We see here and there tremendous rescue plans and, and that uh, uh, in a way will help uh, the transition or the, to ease, let's say, the, the, the economic recovery. But for some countries where there is absolutely no, let's say, reserve and no capacity to absorb economically, isn't it a risk of um, a real chaos? uh an economic chaos but also a security chaos um with a possible agenda from some groups you know to take this opportunity to destabilize uh, those countries and that we would be heading towards an even more let's say unbalanced world i think this is quite an important issue we don't know yet exactly what will happen in the next few days or weeks uh, in some part of the poorest countries in the world, uh, but do you see that as a major threat? And do you, how do you see uh, this as a, a, an opportunity or a possibility to respond? Very quickly, Sh Shada first. Yes, yeah, so I think uh, absolutely right, Jean Christophe. Inequalities, inequalities have to be dealt with within our Europe within our West, between the richer segments of our society and the poorer, poorer segments, between the gig economy and the sort of strong economy led by the banks, all of these inequalities uh, have to be settled, have to be eased. And you're right that we in the West with our fiscal space and our stimulus that we're being allowed to use now, rather than the austerity measures that have brought us to our knees in many, many countries of, of Europe, those are going to help us. Now we have to look outwards and see how we can help others, not because we're being generous, because if the world does not develop and grow, we will have no export markets, as simple as that. So we need to help the Africa, the South Asia's and the Latin Americas of this world. And I see, I, I see two ways of doing it. One is um, through debt forgiveness, uh, debt that has been accumulating over the years in these countries is choking them to death, many, many countries. They're going into austerity, they're going into lockdown and their daily wage earners cannot even eat uh, so they're going to be dying from hunger and famine uh, and, and not from Corona or both, you know. So we need to think beyond our borders. We need to bring in a little bit of humanity into our thinking. So the first thing is debt forgiveness. And when we talk, secondly, when we talk in Europe of a basic income for our European and Western citizens, we should also think of a basic income for the rest of the world. It can be done. Studies prove that it can be done. It's not free money. People who get uh, basic income, guaranteed income, monthly, weekly, they use it for good reason. So we have to, and this is going to be crucial because the terrorism, the security threats that you mentioned will come also from increased poverty and hunger in many parts of the world. 
Um, so we have to think about the world as being really, really interconnected. If we want security in Europe, we need to help Africa. It's as simple as that. We have to help Africa grow and develop as it was doing before it was hit by these terrible, terrible lockdowns, um, which are necessary. I'm not saying they're not, uh, but you, this is having an enormous disastrous impact on African economies. And there, I have to turn to you, Henry. China has a role to play. China is a big partner in Africa. China should be forgiving African debt. BRI is loans, uh, not grants. Uh, your help in, in Africa can, comes with some strings attached. So, you know, you will have to start easing and loosening those restrictions and conditionalities as well, as we will in Europe have to do as well. So this is really part of our story. North-South cleavages cannot go on. The North will not survive if the South does not. Thank yeah, you. I think you anyway. Yeah, I think you have raised some good points. And the, what, what I can see is that uh, there are probably three things we could do uh, to do that. Because I, as, as uh, we all know that uh, we are one world. I mean, this uh, Lady Gaga as you show has, has demonstrated that, uh, you know, it reminds me of the African famine in the 80s that, uh, uh, you know, we are, we are the world. So I think that uh, uh, basically, uh, so all the countries who have, uh, you know, those well to do, maybe relatively well to do, getting out of this crisis first, should start to aid, uh, you know, uh, support uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 these developing countries. Uh, for example, China is sending many uh, medical teams, uh, some medical supplies and uh, equipment to some of those uh, developing countries to help them fight the uh, coronavirus. And that should be do uh, as much as we can, as, as well as often as we can. So this is, should be encouraged for all countries. Second, I think that uh, uh, multilateralism uh, uh, should be strengthened, like an organization like WHO should be really empowered and should be really, uh, you know, give more resources, should really help in those countries uh, to guide them to, to go through the crisis. And, uh, and uh, you know, like uh, uh, their funding should be supported. I'm, I'm really, uh, uh, really uh, thankful for Bill Gates Foundation to donate uh, uh, 150 million uh, US dollars to, to the WHO to, so that WHO can function. Uh, it's very important for developing countries to have that. Uh, finally, I think also the, the NGOs, the, all the other, all social fabric, all the social forces should be working together to really starting to help. So we should really have this humanitarian spirit, not only for the government, but for the whole society, all sectors, all walks of life that we should all put together to help uh, the, 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 these developing countries. If we are surviving, we, we should really help each other. As uh, we all know that uh, no country, no, no man is a safe uh, island. We all depend on each other. And uh, so uh, their future is our future. So we have to work together. Thank you. Thanks to both of you actually for this uh, extremely rich and also very frank uh, discussion. Uh, the time now is coming to turn to Dr. Yakunin to share his perspective. Just uh, let me uh, mention two uh, information. One is uh, next week on April 29th, we will have the third seminar, part of this uh, series on uh, the global pandemic, the way forward. And we will be looking this time next week uh, on the implication or impact on society, way of life, culture and civilization. So this will be, of course, uh, uh, another very interesting exchange uh, with uh, uh, speakers from different parts of the world, from Russia, uh, from India, uh, from uh, uh, Europe. And um, uh, so please, uh, uh, please register for this. One last piece of information, because we have mentioned several times uh, the United Nations and the summit in September. Uh, the Dialogue of Civilization Institute has launched last week a global consultation on the future of international cooperation and the future of the UN. Um, you can find all information uh, on the website. And so we are asking people from all around the world to contribute ideas about how to improve, how to reform, how to reinvent uh, the United Nations that we need uh, in uh, this very specific context. So uh, this is time also for everyone uh, to voice their concern, to voice their views. And uh, we have already received hundreds of uh, uh, feedback from all around the world. 
and uh, we're very keen uh, in a way and working very closely uh, with uh, the Secretary General's office um, in a very privileged way uh, to contribute uh, the feedback and input at the time of the UN declaration by the head of state. So thanks again, and I'm have, very happy to turn to uh, Dr. Yakunin, uh, the founder uh, of DOC and the chairman uh, of the board. Hello everyone, and thank you, Jean Christophe. After all this additional information, you know, it is difficult to, you know, to collect the minds concerning the discussion, but I would like to praise the efforts of our speakers uh, during this webinar. And I also was following the questions which could not be answered, uh, all of them, but I will pick up with something to my mind very essential to this webinar. This is webinar of DOC Research Institute, Dialogue of Civilization Research Institute. And we are proud to, uh, to state that through the history of Dialogue of Civilization, whether it was World Public Forum or DOC, we were always promoting the ideas of solidarity and equality of the nations and civilizations. What we are talking, or not only us, many experts are talking now about lack of solidarity, lack of, you know, equality. I'm not going to give some examples of of a dramatic scale when inside Europe, some country can close the border and stop the, you know, shipment of medical equipment. You know, Shada, you know that better than myself. And this is not reflection of solidarity at all. So we can continue that, but instead we need to concentrate on the basic of values which promote the idea of solidarity, equality, and, um, you know, development of new relations. To my mind, what we were talking today is the fact that we already are living in somewhat different world. It is not the world after pandemic. We are already in this new world. And it is absolutely high time to consider. Shada, I was shocked. You said exactly what I was meant to say. Can you imagine that me permitted a kid to the locomotive driver's seat to drive the train. It is not possible. And you are referring to the leaders of the world as the children playing in the kindergarten. How comes? We never permitted to drive the train. We never permitted a kid to make a surgery, but we are permitting somebody to drive the entire world to where? So to my mind, the answer to the question, whether this meeting of global leaders will be fruitful or not, depends on the ability mm. of even this generation of the politician to understand their responsibility. They cannot do much, but at least they can do something and we need the change of the generation of politicians to see the actual fruits of that. This is first remark. Second, I suppose even in this dramatic period of time, and even judging by some questions, you know, I should say that we are still stuck in the frame of ideologized politics. Mm -hmm. You agree? Because, you know, I can give you you know, I made some research while you were, you know, delivering your speeches. For example, index of democracy and Nave is 987, while uh, United States even 7.96, Russia is 311, and Iran 238. And somebody in the question challenged that democratic countries were dealing with the crisis, COVID crisis, better than others. It is not true. Irrespectful of east, east or west, south or north, this virus hit the population dramatically. And if we consider the results, or actual, not results, but you know, nowadays situation, we can see that Iran is hit very dramatically. 
but Iran was deprived to buy medical shipment to help their people. I'm not, you know, discussing why, but that is sanctions. While the best, uh, you know, example of democratic country, United States of America, are suffering tremendous losses of lives. So it is not democracy, mm -hmm. autocratia, or something like that. That is the quality of political system mm -hmm. as a whole. And we should understand that just trying to close our eyes, not to, you know, to, to, to recognize this, we will never find the way how to face future challenges, which humanity will obviously will have in front of it. And, you know, some uh, very important to my, 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 my mind conclusion, uh, because of your, you know, beautiful remarks, I suppose that institutions, not only politicians, appear not able to tackle this crisis properly, this crisis properly. And this is the lesson you should learn immediately. Then, uh, reasonable and very serious ex experts like you, I'm mentioning uh, uh, Kissinger and William uh, Hague, they were talking about solidarity, they were talking about this kind of activity. That were old style politicians. Why the younger politicians, the younger generations are not able to see the substance of the difficulties because they were taught like that. And that is the problem of education, not only political education, but as a whole education system. So, you know, since the virus is not tackled yet, I suppose we will see more dramatic development in the world, even now. And I think that what we, you were talking about helping each other, necessity of solidarity, it should become the essence of global politics nowadays. We are talking about globalization and Professor Wang assured us that globalization will continue. But may I say, it should be absolutely different type of globalization. Not globalization of domination, but globalization of solidarity in front of the enemy, which is dangerous to entire humanity. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Yakunin, for uh, those words of uh, also wisdom. And I think it is very reassuring that uh, you and uh, our guest speaker have been, in a way, very strong in their call for uh, strengthening, developing, intensifying uh, all mechanisms for cooperation. This will be probably the key priority in the months to come, and this will be also the responsibility for everyone. Indeed, this is one other major, let's say, call or lessons from this exchange is that this is not just the matter of government uh, and, uh, and, and, and official voices, but this is now the responsibility of everyone. And uh, I'd like just to remind what we had a, a very interesting discussion a few weeks ago by the new Program Council of the Dialogue of Civilization Institute. And there was a very strong voice, you know, to call for a new internationalism or a new supranationalism. This is a unique moment in time where uh, indeed uh, we can go one route or one other and uh, the future of humanity will be very aff affected by the way we have the capacity to mobilize resources and energy. So thanks a lot. And uh, we certainly want to continue uh, the conversation with uh, you, Shada, and you, uh, Henry, um, and, um, and also with all of our guests. You know, we, uh, we still have uh, 
more than 110 people. So we have lost only 10 uh, after 75 minutes, which I think shows that uh, you have managed to, to get their attention. Uh, once again, apologies for those who have not received responses, but we will get back to you. Um, and having, keep in mind, you know, the, our rendezvous uh, next week on the 29th for the third uh, of this webinar series. Thanks again to our guests and uh, to our audience, um, and we'll be in touch very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.